William Warren Taylor, the eldest son of Joseph Taylor Jr. and Sarah Best, was born 21 March 1787 in Martin County, North Carolina. Because of the boundary changes, the Taylor land holdings later changes to Tyrell, then Edgecombe County, North Carolina. William was raised on the Taylor Plantation near Canedo Creek. He was surrounded with loving parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. William lived in North Carolina until he was 21 years old. When he left that beautiful state to carve out his destiny in Kentucky, the new home that he and his parents chose was a lovely place 12 miles north of Bowling Green and just west of Richardville, near the Barren River. His, here his parents bought 276 acres of fertile land and wonderful springs provided a good source of water for the family. About the same time that the Taylors came to Kentucky, then John Patrick and Sarah Kundrick family also settled there. They had left their home in Halifax County, North Carolina, and prior to that had lived in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. Bringing a large family of 11 children, the Patricks settled about eight miles west of Bowling Green. William Taylor and Elizabeth Patrick met fell in love and married 22 March 1811 in Warren County, probably at the Taylor family cabin by a Baptist minister, Robert Daugherty. According to the Warren County court records, William had important responsibilities in Warren County concerning the roads. A farmer, he worked hard for his wife and family. He and Elizabeth raised 11 children near Richardsville from 1812 to 1830. In 1830 or 31, William and Elizabeth decided to leave Warren County, Kentucky, and moved to Missouri. This must have been a very difficult decision for them because of the family circumstances. William's father had passed away 22 March 1818, leaving his mother still living in the cabin he had built with his faithful slave, Jake, to help care for her. To leave meant that William probably would never see his mother again. Elizabeth, too, had lost her father, John Patrick, in November 1816, and probably wondered if she would ever see her mother again. Contemplating a move of more than 250 miles, both must have wondered if they would ever see their parents, their mothers again. William and Elizabeth made the difficult journey to eastern Missouri and settled in Monroe County in 1830 or 31. Their son, Pleasant Green Taylor, did later described the area as a part of Missouri that was a wilderness inhabited by the Red Man and numerous wild animals abound, abounded there. It was a beautiful country consisting of prairie and timber. William had a home consisting of 640 acres of valuable land. Lutz and Green Patrick, one of Elizabeth's brother, had preceded them into Missouri where he obtained a grant land 3 November 1831. William Taylor, a strong man, standing over six foot tall, was purported to have been very pronounced in his views as a Democrat, well acquainted with the Bible. He and Elizabeth taught their children to love the book and its teachings. After the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized in upstate New York, its members had encountered opposition and persecution wherever they went in search of peace and safety. Evidently, Hiram Smith and John Murdoch, missionaries of the LDS Church, found William Taylor's family in Monroe County sometime in 1832. William thought he was the first person to be baptized in the church in the state of Missouri. He was baptized after hearing only one sermon. He was soon ordained an elder and became an earnest expounder of the doctrines of the church. He became a member of the Salt River Branch, also known as the Bowling Green Branch, which was organized in that area. Meanwhile, a group of Latter-day Saints had settled in western Missouri and Jackson County, commanded to live the law of consecration and to purchase the land for an inheritance. They were soon plagued by the spirit of speculation and feelings of disunity. Failing to heed the counsels of authority, they soon aroused the hostility of older settlers there, which led to mobbings and severe persecution. Concerned for their welfare, the Prophet Joseph Smith organized a group of men, Zion's Camp, to march from Ohio and give them aid. Zion's Camp traveled westward toward Jackson County, arrived at the Salt River Settlement on 7 June 1834. Next day, Sunday, after the meetings had been held, Hiram Smith and Lyron Wright arrived from the additional volunteers as the Salt Lake River branch, Zion's Camp, reached its maximum strength after of the 200 the Jackson men. County, Missouri. The camp disbanded part of them remaining in Missouri, while the rest made their way back to Kirtland, Ohio in small groups. William and Elizabeth settled next in the, on the Fishing River in Ray County, Missouri. There, William bought two good farms remaining there until the fall of 1834, 
They encountered such, encountered such bitter persecution that they and other saints in the area had to leave their homes once again. William received nothing for his land. He was also robbed of $500 in cash, 75 hogs, and a considerable amount of property. William's family next moved to Long Creek, eight miles south of far west in Clay County. There, William bought 320 acres of land in October 1835. The family remained in this location until the spring of 39. By 1837, there were three more children born added to the family, making a total of 14 children, seven sons and seven daughters. All the members of the family witnessed the laying of the cornerstone of the temple at far west. They also moved into the city late in the fall of 1838, where they were compelled to camp in the streets. So many saints had gathered there to escape mob violence that shelter could not be obtained. Arriving at night, they made their beds upon the ground. Snow fell during the night to the depth of 10 inches, covering their beds, clothing, shoes, and stockings as they laid spread upon, spread upon the ground. They saw the prophet Joseph surrender himself to the mob, and they heard the dreadful confusion made by the mob the following night. Elizabeth Taylor prepared food and carried it to the brethren who were held at the prison in Liberty Jail. After the surrender of the city, the Taylors returned to their home a distance of eight miles. There they found that, that about 7,000 of the mob people had camped there for two nights and uh, turned their horses into the Taylors' cornfield. The mob ate or destroyed about 300 bushels of potatoes, 75 geese, 100 chickens, several head of cattle, 40 head of hog, 20 stands of bees, two. They had burned about one mile of rail fencing for campfires. On 8 February 1839, they again moved from their home, leaving a thousand bushels of corn in the crib, for which they received an all neck yoke valued at $2.50. They received nothing for their farm and improvements. Together with the other faithful saints, they were expelled from their homes and from the state of Missouri by order of Governor Boggs. Their journey took them over 150 miles across the Mississippi River and into Illinois. Much of the time, the weather was very cold and stormy. Consequently, the roads were muddy and miserable. Along their route of travel, the local residents were unkind, often turning the hungry from their doors. Pleasant Green Taylor later recalled that once on the journey, he watched a poor woman carrying a child in her arms. When the woman stopped at a house by the roadside to ask for a morsel of bread for him, herself and child, the man called her a, a damn Mormon and ordered her to leave, giving her nothing to eat. Pleasant Green related another incident which portrays the Christ-like nature of his father. When an aged couple named Singleton lost their only horse on the exodus, they were powerless to move their wagon beyond the reach of the mob. William Taylor unhitched one of his best horses and hitched it to the old gentleman's wagon and told the couple to take the horse and go in peace. So much of the blessings that come during adversity when willing hearts are in tune with the Spirit. While en route for their destination in Illinois, William became ill, died 9 September 1839, probably from typhoid. He was buried beside the main road. His grave was five miles from Lima and eight miles from Warsaw, Illinois. Later, a marker was put in the cemetery in Illinois to honor them. The burial was made on land belonging to Colonel Le Levi Williams, a bitter enemy of the church. A few days later, Colonel Williams boasted of having helped to kill the prophet, and he threatened to dig up the body of William Taylor and give it to the hogs. Elizabeth called on her sons to gather some logs and poles, make a fence around the grave, and ensure that the body was not disturbed. A short time before his death, William called his children to his bedside and counseled them to rally around the priesthood and the main body of the church. He also cured a promise from each of them that they would not marry outside the church. Throughout his life, William was industrious, progressive, and resourceful. He had a strong will, but was humble and God-fearing. He had a great faith and courage to withstand wealth or poverty, whichever was his lot. When he decided to join the church, his relatives pleaded with him not to join. However, he had the courage of his convictions. He was baptized. He lost all of what he owned in worldly goods, <clears throat> but he had the wisdom to recognize that these could not compare with the riches of eternity. Like the saints of old, he did not shrink from giving his life for the right cause. His death was brought on by hardship endured through the forced journey and from persecutions, mobbings of lawless Missourians. All these trials weakened him so the resulting disease could destroy his life. And this was an autobiography 
based on Sarah Sherry Humphrey Frankie in her book. Uh, 